Everybody, everybody who y'all been watching this Strong Inspiration channel, I know you're watching it. I know you're watching it. I know you feeling what I'm doing because I'm feeling it. It's just too much information for you not to enjoy uh, Strong Inspirations where we come at you straight, no chasing. I'm Anthony Brogdon. I'm just an ordinary guy who trying to do something extraordinary, maybe. I don't know what I'm, but I like what I'm doing. And it just kind of came to me to uh, find a way to keep black history alive. Cause as you might know, I'm a filmmaker and I'm an author and I write about black history. But before I go into that, you know what I'm gonna ask you to do my friends, hook me up please and subscribe to this channel. Come on, it's free. Just hit the button. I like this video because the sister looking good. She got her dreads ready to go. She, she's ready early. So like this video. Uh, hit the <laughs> notifications bell so you get a ding because I'm putting up four or five videos a week now. And uh, tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself. This ain't, this, this don't have to be no secret. All right. Uh, this is the uh, DVD to my movie. It's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. It took me two years to do this movie, right? Where I had to do all this research and uh, I put it in the film and then I found these older people uh, to tell, help me tell the story. The movie starts and ends with a guy that was 101 years old at the time. He lived to be 103 and he, you know, shares mm. some of his wisdom, right? It's uh, 75 minutes long and it's streaming on Amazon. You'll, you'll really like this. It's, it's well worth watching, not just because I did it, but I, you know, I've had other people say that. Uh, and it's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. And I had so much fun doing it. I wrote a book uh, <laughs> titled Black Business Book, uh, over 200 amazing facts on black history. I'm not even gonna tell you none of the facts. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to tell you, if you read my book and you knew everything in here already, I give your money back. No <laughs> questions asked. All right. And the book and the movie is on Amazon. But if you want to cut the big Amazon man out, you know, and you know, he got enough money, uh, go to my website, uh, go to inspirationsbystrong.com. As you can tell, everything I do is the word strong, which stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. Oh, my, my. And hey, watch this. I got a strong sister that's about to tell us who she is and what she does. So sister, go ahead and do your thing strongly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now let's go. Well, thank you, Strong Anthony. Yes. <laughs> My name is, <laughs> yes. yes, I am uh, delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Lamurchi Frazier. I am a visual artist, historian, educator, poet, holographer, and a lover of my people. Oh, I, uh, you see my sign, like to don't think you? Of, <laughs> you see my sign? Yeah. So, uh, I'm pleased to be here <clears throat> as one who has had residencies around the world as a visual artist, Taiwan, France, Cuba, Africa, um, to name a few of the places that I've been. What kind of artist are you? Know, some of my works are on the wall. I do fiber quilts. Uh, they tell stories. I'm a storyteller in the narrative oh, of fiber and, I see, and, and I fabric. See. That's not, those are not paintings. Those are actual pieces of fabric put together. I got, my question is, um, you, you let black history in some respects be what you tell in your art? Oh, absolutely. My, my work is called the, uh, the Quilted Chronicles and whether it is in the quilts or whether that chronicling of history 
is done through any of the images that I create. It is about my one life work, even spoken word called yeah. Save Me From My Amnesia. And let me ask you and this. And so it is about. Mm -hmm. do you, when you go back and uh, do, you, do you know any of the history of some of the, what black people did art wise? Were was, was slaves that, was there an artist that was, was there a slave that was an artist you think? Oh, there were many enslaved and I, I don't, they're in a condition of being enslaved. I know you got it. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah, want to yeah. explain why I say that because our vocabulary and how we describe ourselves, identifying ourselves is very important. Oh, sure. No, and so, you're... you know, so yeah. you know, this is for me. I mean, this is something I learned. This is not yeah. any kind of, uh, you don't have to feel some kind of way, like you say, yeah. uh, about that. Right. It is a term that, we should start using more and more. Yeah, right, uh, right, right. And not let other people from outside of us describe us. Right. So in, in that, I speak of the, the history of enslaved people. Um, and I am director of education for the Museum of African American History in Boston and in Nantucket. And looking at the early beginnings in Boston, you find and uh, can uncover as we have uh, entrepreneurs who were black from the moment of our arrival. Um, and we can talk about that in Boston in 1638. Uh, and from that across centuries of entrepreneurship. And one of the areas of entrepreneurship or industry is arts entertainment okay. and arts, fine arts as a, a participation. One of the most salient uh, examples of that is sculptor Edmonia Lewis, who oh, was yeah. uh, a sculptor of fine art marble sculptures out of one piece of marble. She is famous in, um, in the world of art. She was, she attended um, a school called Oberlin, funded yeah. by her brother, who had struck it rich in the uh, 1849 uh, gold rush. And so and he paid for her people. education. Yes, her brother. She was of Haitian and indigenous extract uh, and had been orphaned. And uh, so she was with her mother's people who were uh, a native people. And as she learned the value of art and sculpture, she began to craft it and become an expert. But as she was, in Oberlin in her last year, she was accused of uh, poisoning two white students. And so the town discriminated against her and drug her through um, uh, the street really until she was put on trial. And when she was put on trial, they, they had to acquit her because they couldn't prove it. So Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison from, that came from Boston, heard about her through the networks underground networks, they, they understood you. she was there and being persecuted. And so they asked her to come to Boston and she did. So she mm -hmm. studied, continued her studies in Boston and uh, was with a master sculptor. And by the age of 20, um, she had sculpted Cohen's of Phyllis Wheatley, um, John Brown. Um, um, uh, she was entering into this study when the 54th Massachusetts Regiment came through Boston and she saw this Colonel on a horse leading that regiment and was struck by his image. And so her most famous sculpture, sculpture is this bust of Colonel Robert Shaw. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a treasure in the United States. They found some of her sculpture in Chicago and like in a junk heap, junk heap and found out it was worth millions and millions of dollars. Really? So she decided though, at the, at the age of um, 20 or so to leave the country because she didn't want to be in this country that in, it was enduring slavery. So she expatriated to Italy and she did all her work from there. Really? And Frederick Douglass, when he made his travels through um, North Africa and Europe, went to see her at her studio in Florence, Italy. There is a plaque of her uh, in Florence, Italy, Italy to her memory. Yeah. She dies in London. Oh, so man, this is this is Edmonia Lewis, but there are many others in the book of uh, 
first, first edition of Phyllis Wheatley's poems on various subjects, religious and moral, mm -hmm. there is an artist rendition of her image. 1773, this was published. His name was Cyprio Moorhead and he was her enslaved next door neighbor. And he did that visual art image of her that we can see her with her writing tools as you know a very young woman. And so um, it, the visual art canon for African descended people and African American people begins for me at that moment as this literary art and this visual art that this book announces. Okay, at let, that me, let me time stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. Now, now let me get this straight. The lady was <laughs> born when? Oh, the, the sculptor was born in, uh, around the 1840s. Oh, 18. Okay, okay, 18. And then she went to Oberlin. She went to Oberlin. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. And so did she sell her work? How did she? Oh, she did. She did. She even sold it from Italy. Um, after she was there, she would have exhibitions in even places like California. And she would charge uh, 10 cents for children and 25 cents for adults. And she would ship her work to, to America. Okay, let me and ask so, you this question. She was an how abolitionist. Did, how did she get to Italy from, from Boston? She bought a, a, a boat, a ticket on the boat and sailed over? She bought there? a ticket and went. Like, you know, we don't think of people during the time of slavery as traveling so globally. Yeah, exactly. But they did. They did. And they did work. And they, they uh, even inspired people to join the abolitionist movement here. I have uh, throngs of people I can talk about. I can tell you their names, where they went, how they talked. Frederick Douglass himself went to Ireland and England in 1845 after he wrote his first narrative on the life of Frederick Douglass. Uh, and the abolitionist, because he had given real names in that book, knew that he was on the run. And they said, you should leave this country. And so he did. When he went to Ireland, he spoke and was uh, allied with a, a lawyer there who had him on a, a tour to speak. He went from there to England. And when he was in England, they embraced him there also. There are spaces in Ireland right now where they have sculptures, monumental sculptures of Douglas. Wow. And so, yeah, I didn't so, know that, that Black yes. folks could travel internationally. Oh, yes. Phyllis Wheatley, in order to get her manuscript published, they wouldn't publish it in America. She was 20 years old when she traveled to England because the Duchess there said that she would publish her work if she brought it with her and they had proven uh, that she had written it. And there were 18 white men who, who, who uh, tested her on her manuscript and verified that she had written it. The, the governor of the state of Massachusetts, uh, the Harvard scholars, ministers, 18 of them schooled, uh, uh, actually tested her and proved that she wrote it. Then she was sent to England to publish her manuscript. So these people were moving. They weren't just static people. They were, you know, they were also, they were also dedicated to abolition and the end of slavery for their brothers and sisters. Let me, let me ask you this. Oh, if you, um, if you know this answer, what kind of ship is that that they sell in over to Europe and stuff like that? Is that I know, I know there's difference between the slave ship and the and the and the, and the transportation ship. I mean, in terms of were oh, you was it, it was that racism on the boat, do you think? Absolutely. And wow. you can read about some of that in some of their travels. A, a woman who wrote a travel novel, uh, travel narrative, and it's on the internet. Her name was Nancy Gardner Prince. She talked about as a black woman sailing on the sea uh, as she married a man, a black man who was a, a guard in the Tsar of Russia's court. She married him in Boston in 1824. He was also a, a Prince Hall Mason. And she, she and he went to Russia to live for 10 years. She writes about traveling on the sea. And after she came back to Boston, she went to Jamaica. She traveled alone because her husband had died. But she traveled alone to Jamaica. And she writes about what it was like on those uh, passenger vessels 
Let me, let me ask you this. So now you would suspect, uh, and from what I'm gathering, and I, I've long heard this, when they went to Europe, they were more accepted than they were in America. They, they didn't have that racial strife over there that they have here, so to speak, and that uh, some white folks over there would really kind of embrace them in their arts and crafts. There are people who believe that they're, they're the thinking and intellectual capacity of Black people was was something to be reckoned with was real i got you i like you, that. you understand yeah. and so like people like thomas jefferson didn't believe that he wrote in the notes on the state of virginia in 1785 that black people phyllis wheatley couldn't have possibly been a poet because she couldn't possibly as a negro be have an imagination I okay he you. wrote you, you understand so there are different uh positions that people take who are um, not black. I got um, you. With respect to who they're dealing with, yeah. um, there are those who are dedicated to abolition. There are European yeah. people who are European and American whites who are dedicated to this idea of abolition. But I got you. You would have to understand that case by case. Yes. You yeah. have to understand how much or uh, how gradually they wanted slavery to end. Yeah. or what was the pace with that I got you. there was I got no you. wholesale you I know you. like and even even if they raised you in many instances it would be in comparison with the white race i got you and it would say oh yeah you you have these rights but i get them before you do i got and you so Mm -hmm. I got you. Now, the one of the uh, when we talk about the arts uh, and for black people, and I'm moving up the timeline uh, probably yes. considerably. Uh, I mm -hmm. go into that Harlem Renaissance era. Absolutely. Yeah, you 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 know we that that was the what was that? You have an arts movement that is uh, philosophically embraced by Alain Locke, who writes uh, the New Negro. The New Negro is the philosophy that's written by 1924 that gives the Harlem Renaissance its underpinnings and the agreement by Du Bois, by um, 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 Langston Hughes, the Talented Tenth and others to embrace this moment of using art and culture to raise the race, to raise the image of black people yeah. and black people redefining themselves. And so in these centers, I always think about not just the Harlem Renaissance being, the, being in New York, but it being the Mecca of what is happening as a network of people in Philadelphia, New York, uh, Chicago, Detroit, and these places where African people, African descended people are arriving and yeah. taking on what they have been promised as a new life. Yeah. And so as this begins to reflect people like Bessie Smith, Bessie Smith is uh, moving from the rural parts of where she's from to the city. So her blues changes from that which is reflective of the environment that she was in to a more hard surface urban kind of blues. The shift mm -hmm. in that and the shift from that and, and, and the, the focus from the gospel uh, and um, the gospel songs and the work songs into that, which becomes uh, um, jazz. Sure. But when we talk about you know, this very simplistically, we're talking about the evolution of music, of art, of culture. We have this shift that even Duke Ellington, as he's writing these new scores of music that has taken classical and pulled it into a black art form into jazz. He says, my, my music is not jazz. My, my music is African music. And so when we talk about this embrace of identity by black people, we're talking about that Harlem Renaissance. Renaissance means rebirth. I and like it. It is geographically I placed like in these different spaces. Let me ask you this. When we talk about the Harlem Renaissance, um, they, they like, like Langston Hughes, he wrote books and poetry, right? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Uh, who published it and how did it get out to the country? Uh, many of the uh, artists like Langston Hughes were also sponsored by um, a foundation like the Harmon Foundation and others. The Negro Club, the women, the women are partly responsible in their Negro Women's Club movement for these associations that support the literary 
publishing. But the Harmon Foundation and other benefactual um, foundations uh, publish the works of um, uh, Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston and others. Who, well, let me ask you this: Do they, mm -hmm. they do they send that work to bookstores? How does the work? How does their work get out? Well, they, they, yeah. Well, I, I think that's a great question because um, the Crisis Magazine was uh, around when people like Marcus Garvey were in New York. Um, in, um, and he's not deported till 1827. So there's this embrace of black people doing for themselves. So there's some support within community to purchase these items. There's also exhibitions funded by the Fa Harmon Foundation and others that um, uh, has the first Negro exhibitions and people like Jacob Lawrence who have studied at Augusta Savage's school. She had a school in Harlem for her own black uh, people. And uh, Jacob Lawrence was one of her students. And 10 years later, his work is in the first exhibition at, um, at uh, MoMA and, and uh, becomes widely uh, understood, if you will. They, okay. they begin to collect his work. But these, these works are in Philadelphia in exhibitions, in New York in exhibitions, in Detroit in exhibitions. And, and, and then the later generations like Romy Bearden create these um, these societies like that are group organizations like Spiral. Spiral had Gwendolyn Brooks, um, Romy Bearden, Norman Lewis, all of them were thinking together as writers and visual artists Ooh, to, like to put this together. You know, yeah. then you have the arise of, of after them of Afro Cobra in the 1960s and, and we, we, we Usi and Obasa that are uh, forming these art organizations that are going to push themselves out. You must have your own. You must have your own galleries, your own museums, yeah. your own studios, because you are not going to be put into the mainstream. Yeah. So there was this understanding of uniting to form these artist organizations yeah. that would support themselves and let, pro let, promote let, themselves. Let me ask you this question. And, you know, I always got to put this in there, you know, because of the racist. Do the racist people start doing something to try to undermine all this advancement? Oh, there's always an undermining. There's always another story. I mean, they okay, don't put so, no laws that and, and black can't people can't do the art enough. <laughs> what do the white people okay. do? Well, the Western world, one of the reasons that Elizabeth Catler was saying that we need to create our own galleries, organizations, museums, and studios is that the embrace of the Western art world was from a European aesthetic. And it was from a, an aspect of white people bigging up themselves, if you will, to use our some of our more modern terms. And so the, the pushback against Negro artists as they were described in the papers is documented. Uh -huh. It's documented about how in, there had to be this formation even in, in making films. We have Oscar Michaud as the first filmmaker, but those were called the race films. Those are not called like, you know, productions on, uh, that were in by DeMille and on all these other people. Yeah. It, these are productions that produce a, a racist lens on even the race films and the, the distribution owned by people who do not look like us is a part of the problem. Even actresses, um, actresses and actors, um, Paul Robeson, one of the greatest yeah. actors. He was he was a Columbia Law School graduate. He could not enter into the law profession without discrimination. Yeah. And so he quit that. He became an actor and a singer. And his great voice resounded as he went through the world, but it always was met with this issue of racism. Yeah. It was also met with this issue of class. It was yeah. also met with the definitions by European people. Yeah, real I, know, okay. yeah, yeah, I know it's always some angle that they pull on it. People, people like Josephine Baker, um, um, Nina Simone yeah. uh, always talked about this. This I and Jane Baldwin speaks to it. Though they are received, there is still yep. in, in Europe, there they come back to a country where they meet with uh, absolute, uh, obvious racism yeah. from the press, from the people. Uh, there was, and, and it's been noted, 
that because of the words uh, said, and I don't know the name, you know it, the name of the song by um, by Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday. Yeah, the song so. she sang, well, mm -hmm. and, and the NAACP, I, 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 again, you know it, picked up on the song. That ruined her career. Yes, because it was espousing in a moderate, moder modern, popular form of music a message that would hit everybody. You go to one more before we get, you know, kind of come close. Then okay. I remember growing up and they had those movies that and they, 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 they came with this term called them black exploitation movies. Yes. The, the Pam Greer and and and, mm -hmm. and 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 all those. And those, I don't know what they said, the exploitation, that made it sound like something was wrong with them. Uh, in the well, movie, well, they were great productions. They were great productions but they were also loaded with stereotypical information. Oh. That's not necessarily uh, what I everybody see. was in agreement with. Okay, so how about it's this exploiting one? certain features of I black life. I, how about this one? And then this one, this was, uh, I, I, I got it on uh, record now and I, I wanna get to see it again, but the movie that really blew my mind the most and put me down, if I could say that, was Sounder. Uh -huh. Sister Tyson. Oh I have, my God, Sounder was know. that took my breath away. Yes, it did. Because it put <laughs> slavery right in front of you. And I yes, was like, did. man, I don't know if I, I think I cried at the end. <laughs> that sounder was strong. But it black was. folks been doing this a long time and telling our own story. You can't, that's why I call it strong. You can't keep us down. No, we're talking can't. about uh, sisters that's a sculpture, world renowned world in the eighteen hundreds. In the eighteen hundreds, yes. I know and you haven't seen all uh, of them, but Reverend you're giving Robert. us some insight into this yes, to, to, to to our resiliency and to yes, this, absolutely, even, absolutely, even in the arts to tell our own story. I, I thank you so story. very much for being on <laughs> strong inspirations and 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 expounding as you have, everybody. I. This sister right here, I, I called her a few times and she said, hold on, I'm, I'm busy. I'm gonna get back <laughs> with you. And she finally on the channel. She got, oh, this was good. So I'm gonna well, tell you folks, come well, thank on you for inviting subscribe me. subscribe button, hit that like button on this video because she done gave you a ton real fast. <laughs> she done gave you a ton of it real fast. Do you have a book yeah. or something? Do you, uh, a website where people can, you know, any of that? Yes, uh, my uh, website is www.lemurchiefrazier.com. L-M-E-R-C-H-I-E-F-R-A-Z-I-E-R. Okay. -E -E yeah. And then so you got some of your art on your website? I have some of my art. Uh, recently, the Minneapolis Institute of Art uh, purchased one of my pieces and dedicated it to George Floyd. Oh boy, I so got way on my channel. Oh my God, folks, I'm telling you, this is what I do. <laughs> Not heavyweight, yeah, just reflecting, sister, just just reflecting our people. You and me, we, we, you know, we in this together. Yeah, we in it together. Everybody, come on now, you know what to do. Uh, <laughs> go to her website, you know, check out her art, buy one of them $10,000 pieces she got up there and, and check out my <laughs> no, book, check out my book. Everybody, I appreciate it. There are conversations you. on the web yeah. on, in that space. Yeah. And if you Google my name, if you just Google my name, you'll um, you'll find some, maybe some interesting conversations Ooh, that, with other yeah, people. Google. She got handlers. <laughs> she got people. <laughs> Everybody, thank you so very much for watching Strong Inspirations. Um, and so to you, my sister, I want to say, I thank you for very much to taking time out to be on the show. It was my I pleasure. To stay strong. Uh, stay safe, stay on your grind. We really appreciate what All you're right. doing. Everybody, we out. Bye-bye. <laughs> Wakanda forever. <laughs> yeah, there you go.